All right. Um, with the panelists, do they have you all have questions or comments for each other? Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, I would have a, a comment for your question, Erin. Um, I liked it very much because I looked into your uh, thoughts before, and of course, they complement what I showed, the erased words. And of course, the, the question, where did this happen or how did it happen? So we know very little about Better Israel schools. Mm -hmm. So we know that there are church schools and churches and monasteries, and we know that also some monasteries of the Better Israel were churches. but in several secondary literature, there's always reference to Better Israel attending church schools. So that might have been a second uh, a setting that I could imagine where, where this uh, lending borrowing of the book could have happened. But of course, we can only speculate. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there was a related question actually from an attendee about um, what words. Sophia, in particular, you have found a race. So Aaron mm -hmm. mentioned Trinity, you mentioned Christos uh, in the example that you had. Are there, is there like a particular set of words that you find erased? So I think it's it's very few words. So the Trinity and all kinds of references to the twin Trinity, uh, Jesus Christ and Mary, obviously. Not mm -hmm. angels, because angels are also venerated by the better Israel, but and also other saints could be venerated by the better Israel, but but these, uh, the Trinity, Jesus Christ, uh, and Mary. But if we think about it, actually, why wouldn't, because the better Israel use Old Testament books, so why would there be Christian words anyway? Um, so the example that I showed is actually a commentary text. So it's a commentary on the Old Testament, but it was written by a Christian. So he commented on it from his Christian standpoint and thus included Christian words in this commentary. Um, and this was the examples that I found where the word uh, was erased. You have the word um, cross. I think it's in the cross. life of Susanna where yes. the Christian version says that they made the sign of the cross and the Beit Israel version says they made a, the sign. And then it just, what sign are they making? Yeah. But it's obvious if you look at the Christian version, what was omitted there. Yeah, yeah. I have a question that goes to, I, both to Sophia and Stephen that's on a, kind of a related note. I think Stephen, you mentioned it in your talk and Sophia, yours is somewhat dependent on the question, but we have instances of um, Christian codices moving to the Beta Israel. And these are the ones that are scratched out. And then there's also these, um, what you call the, your later category, Sophia, where it seems to be Beit Israel scribes. Do we have any um, instances other than the one that I'm arguing for that we know for sure that the Beit Israel are copying from a Christian book that doesn't end up, that they don't have a Christian copy of basically, so that they have access to a Christian library, but not the book, it's, you know, they don't have the book in their possession long-term. Does that make sense? <laughs> I know it's specific, but I think, Steve, I think you mentioned specifically that uh, that they uh, took the books with them, that the Beta Israel um, took well, on. But are they taking books or are they taking text, basically? <laughs> well, that's a good look. There's a tradition in, in one of, in, uh, in a hagiography of a monk, Christian monk who joins the Beta Israel, and then it says he, he wrote or more likely copied the Orit for mm -hmm. them. I mean, so that seems to be a case where he would have brought a manuscript and then made copies of it. Presume, I mean, again, if we accept the traditions of monks who actually join the Beit Israel, um, that would be an avenue yeah. where it would take place. Um, certainly, sometimes the, the uh, Beit Israel must have commissioned Christians to write text for them and then checked the text that they had to be sure that they hadn't snuck in references that they didn't want in there. Right. That, that's what I found so interesting about this one case is that that's what I had been expecting that, you know, someone would commission a work, the Beit Israel commission a work, and then they end up with the text. But in this case, they must have had access to the Christian manuscript itself. So, you know, no, it's fascinating. Thank you. 
There's actually an, a manuscript that um, Pankhurst published on it with uh, ornamental bands. It's a better Israel manuscript, but in the ornamentation there are crosses and they were not erased. So that's actually quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a, an, a thought for Masha. I, I really liked um, the analogy of uh, the Jews forging the nails for Jesus. And how strongly do you think will it have influenced the shunned arts of, of uh, smithing? So that was part of the better Israel tradition. I really like that. Could you stress that a bit? I, more? I, I really don't know. I, uh, I, 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 I'm, I had at one point the idea that this was a, um, a totally ported into Ethiopia, you know, some, this legend of the nail makers. And, um, uh, but it's possible that it, um, that it could have been a parallel, um, uh, development um, um, that maybe um, it was something invented right from the pictorial sources, the prince, and then evolved. But um, I, I still, and I haven't been able to find yet the um, how the these this Western medieval legend. Um, might have been uh, conveyed probably through the speculum humanae salvationis. I mean, it's um, it uh, it's been very hard to do any research uh, these days. So, <laughs> um, it just I, I just have a lot more work to do to find um, uh, these pathways and how they may have um, intersected or interacted with each other. In connection with, with when Marsha talked about, and here I don't remember whether it's something that Hagar Solomon published in her book or it's something that I heard along the way, but um, there's a region in Ethiopia called uh, Sekel. And I remember a tradition that, you know, the Beit Israel lived in that region. Why is that region called that? Because it means the crucifiers, which of course is a complete folk etymology of the name for for the region but it's an interesting gloss on some of what you've been talking about where where people are working from in a sense the the, the tradition into you know you know creative etymologies we have a lot of questions from um panelists sure. i mean from um attendees do you mind if i sure lob sure. out a few um Okay, this one might be um, mostly for Steve, but anyone is willing to jump in just because I know Steve has written about this and knows about them. From Desalen Bizunet, um, what about mention of Ethiopian Jews and outside sources like the Cairo Geniza? Are they important for cross-checking or not Ethiopian sources? I'm not quite sure what mean is meant by cross-checking. To the best of my knowledge, um, there are no mentions in the Cairo Geniza. I mean, I, 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 there's an article that I saw that was published seven or eight years ago, where I think the author act, states this as a fact. Certainly, a number of my colleagues from Hebrew University, who have gone through the, you know, thousands and thousands of fragments and texts there, um, and I'm, I'm not aware. We do have, of course, external sources. There are about a dozen or so Hebrew sources in the 14th and 15th, 16th century where they encounter Beit Israel um, and, you, and you get you know, references to aspects of their customs. Um, it's, the, it's where we find for the first time the idea that they're from the tribe of Dan. Um, there's a mention of the custom of Ethiopian Christians of tattooing in one of the sources. Um, so there are a few, but it's interesting that um, and the vast material from the Cairo Geniza, to the best of my knowledge, we don't have anything about the Beit Israel. And also some references to Beit Israel um, who have been enslaved and are being sold in Egypt, right? And yes. it's about whether yes. 
to redeem them as Jews. Yes, and that, I mean, that's sort of the, the, the classic source for the rabbinic view of the Jewishness of the Beit Israel is the question, um, should they be redeemed if they're brought as slaves? And what is the fate of a woman who we think her husband has been killed, but we don't know, and as, you know, as, a, as a Jewish woman, uh, how is she to be treated? So, I mean, those are you know, important to understand how they were caught up in that slave trade. There is actually a more recent uh, article also on a more recent source from the, uh, um, the slave trade to India, so in the 16th century, which mentions a uh, better Israel boy being sold into slavery. And it's very interesting because it looks as, uh, at him as he was of a very uh, vulnerable source in um, group in, Eth in Ethiopia because he was neither Christian, neither Muslim. So slavery would have had a strong effect on their group. Um, Samantha, I'll alternate with you to pick up questions from the, pan from the attendees. Um, we have one question here from Sean Winslow. Are any of the panelists aware of current manuscript production among the community in Israel? No, unfortunately not. Um, and I think this is a tradition under immediate threat of uh, becoming extinct because the old people who still practice this uh, skills um, are, are just getting old and passing away. So, yeah. There, the only sense in which I know of it um, are, uh, are, are scribes who write amulets for people. Um, and Lisa and Tebi Yamini, and I think wrote about that in her doctoral dissertation uh, book later. But I mean, there's, there's, there are people who write amulets, but that's a, a totally different, you know, phenomena, you know. Um. Um, we have another question from Salama al Fasaha. What about Jewish influence on Ethiopian Christian texts? Does it indicate some Jewish origin text? <laughs> Steve, do you want to take it? Or? Yeah, I'll, I'll start, I, mean, I, think, other I like, think we, yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, look, there's a, there's a, a, a classic debate, you know, in, in Ethiopian studies between uh, Edward Uhlendorf and Maxim Rodenson as to whether the Hebraic Jewish influences on Ethiopian culture are a very early phenomena, pre-Christian, mm -hmm. or a later phenomena. I have to say personally, while I always supported Uhlendorf's views, I'm tending now to see mm -hmm. there's a lot to be said for, for, for what Rodenson has to say. And I think we have to think about it as a process rather than an event. Having said this, and, and Aaron knows, knows, knows more, I mean, let me give an extreme example. Um, Sven Rubinson has, has argued very well, I think, that the idea of the conquering lion of Judah, of the tribe of Judah, actually appears around the time of the Portuguese as, an, mm -hmm. as a motif. Um, on the other hand, the Professor Polotsky's argument about Aramaic loan words seems to assume that that must have happened at a very early date. So there's a lot that's been done on it. In fact, I know there's a new book that's been published about this with, uh, um, is it called Gorgorius Press? Is that the name of the press? Gorgias Press, yeah. Gorgias Press, um, which I actually reviewed prior to publication and I'm, I'm waiting for them to send me my, my complimentary copy um, <laughs> to read it. But but it, it's a it's a it's a major topic with major bibliography. Yeah, I, I would just second the that the current scholarship seems to push these later. So I mean, for me, I think most of the Judaic components are better situated with Zara Yaakov or in the medieval period. So one of the kind of classic examples is the Hebrew influence on the biblical text, the Old Testament text, which some people put at the translation moment, but now it seems quite clear, at least to me, that this is happening much later and likely via Arabic in some way, so well into the medieval period. So, I mean, the Aramaic loan words are still an issue, but yeah. <laughs> I think most of these things probably are late, yeah. at least that's yeah. my take. Mike, Michael Nib, for example, has shown yeah. that the, the Hebraisms in the, in the biblical manuscripts 
seem to be 1500 and later, mm -hmm. not from the early translation. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I'll pick up another question from the chat. This one for Aaron coming from Alessandro Bausi asking, mm -hmm. can you say anything more concerning the hypothesis of erasure of the word Trinity in ML 1939? Are there other cases? One case is interesting as it is still weak evidence. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alessandro. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think that, that your last sentence is the sentence that one case, as interesting as it is, is still weak evidence. That is, so there, there is. This is the only case in the manuscript. So the entire manuscript is Christian texts, all translated from Arabic, and then this one made it into the Beit to Israel. And this is the only time in the entire um, text that you have an erasure. I find it kind of quite interesting because you see this progress. So you see in the first Beta Israel manuscript, um, Beit Lovich Ethiopic 8, that some of the Christian elements are removed, but not near all of them. And then it's written even more in um, the Beit Lovich Ethiopic 16. And this is the one that Wurmbrand published. So for me, this is uh, maybe it's just the first step in the process, but yes, it's the only erasure in the manuscript um, with that text, that's correct. <laughs> weak, but interesting. I would probably put it in that order, weak, but interesting. <laughs> uh, we, we, have, we have a question from Mary Matthews. Was monasticism uh, among the Beta Israel a lifelong celibate existence or a temporary time of voluntary asceticism or study? Shall I or Steve? You can start, Sophia, and then... <laughs> Um, so there is actually a very interesting uh, story about Abad Sabra, the founder, and when he gathered his first followers, he observed that after some time they were not behaving um, correctly enough, so he said that they should become uh, oinukes and should uh, be castrated, and there are these stories that better Israel monks actually had to be castrated. However, we also know that this was uh, told by many Amharic, so Christian sources. So this has, of course, to be taken with a grain of salt. And we also know about um, families that have the sons of monks and so on. Yeah. So this, we can not really say it with precision, but there are these uh, very nice stories. And there is actually, um, it reads something like a miracle story of a monk who lived for many years of a monk, and then he had a row of uh, dreams where God told, uh, told him he should go back to the normal life uh, and revoke his um, monastic life and become a father, which he actually did despite that he was of old age. So um, there are these uh, stories in all kinds of regards, but in general, they should be um, celibate if possible. Yeah, I just, I want to, you have phenomena where um, people, you know, quote unquote, retired into monasticism, um, you know, at a, at an, a later age, yeah. Um, and then, in, in continuing what Sophia just said, um, I think, especially uh, in the 19th century, when um, you know there was a great famine in Ethiopia, then part of demographic pressures. That's when I know there are traditions of people who left monasticism um, to raise families. But that's already when we're coming close to the end of monasticism where, where the, the demographic pressures and the criticisms uh, from both the Protestants and the Jewish envoys who arrive lead to a decline in, in monasticism. And then some people do leave it, but it wasn't something that you did for a while normally. It, you did it at the end of your life or um, in ex exceptional circumstances, you renounced your monastic vows. By the way, there were also nuns, so it's not only a male phenomenon, but we also know about better Israel nuns. Very little, but we do know them. I'd like to bring another question that's directed to Aaron Butts, but I think others might also like to answer it, perhaps especially Marsha Kupfer. This is from Alexandra Kuffel, who writes, I agree that the concept of the spectral or hermeneutical Jew is very useful in understanding Christian depiction of Jews in Ethiopia. However, how do you account for the emergence of this polemical ploy? Is it something that was learned from translated Christian texts from the Arabic speaking world? 
or does it reflect attitudes that have developed among Ethiopian Christians about a self-identified real life Ethiopian Jewish community that is then applied to other groups? A combination? How did these factors develop together? I don't know. That's a uh, wonderful, know. yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question. Um, I, I chose the example that I chose because I think this is a fairly kind of clear case with Zara Yaakob that um, with the Masafa Milad, we have a Christological text and you have this same kind of anti-Jewish polemic and especially this mapping um, in the earlier Christological controversies. So I actually see, if you go back and read this Masafa Milad, that a lot of the arguments are um, kind of quite similar to what you find in early um, texts. So I do think in this case that it may be the influence of Christian Arabic theological literature moving into Ethiopic. So this is kind of, uh, it's a was seemed to be a useful tool and then picked up by Zara Yaakov. The broader question, however, is a is a fascinating one, and I don't have um, solid answers. So I I would my inclination is to go with both. That it, it, you have this mapping is found everywhere throughout the kind of Christian world from late antiquity till the modern period. So I think polygenesis is certainly possible and likely in many cases. So I like the both in this case. Yeah, I would say I would uh, tend to find that very um, reasonable. I think um, there is um, a, uh, the end, the final chapters or the later chapters in the Keber Nagast also have a kind of anti-Jewish um, uh, aspect uh, to them and um, and also, uh, I think there's some question as to, um, you know, the, the layers of the composition of that epic. And it may be that those chapters are in the later um, sort of, uh, I don't know, later genesis of that text or editions or, um, development of that text that was then coming from other sources, maybe Arabic um, uh, influences. I, I, you know, I don't know, um, but I think that that's an, um, a, an example of a, of a kind of diatribe. Um, but there too, I mean, the Solomonic dynasty, which is promoting that uh, legend is, also um, uh, having to, has its target as the previous uh, dynasty. So it's, um, uh, it's hard to say. Is it my turn? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so a question from Ladina Schnapper about manuscripts again. Um, were many manuscripts taken out of Bid Israel manuscripts taken out of Ethiopia with Operation Solomon, uh, et cetera, and are there more still in Ethiopia? Mm, thank you for the question. Actually, I just saw there was another one in the comments from Ilana Tahan, which relates. So I tried to answer both of them. Um, so we, we know about manuscripts that were taken as personal possession during the Aliyah. Um, and we also see if we observe the uh, ceremonies that the Better Israel are holding now that they are also still using uh, manuscripts, not always, but they still uh, are using and within the families, there are still some manuscripts, but we don't know how many uh, that are. So I myself encountered two Better Israel manuscripts that are still in Ethiopia and are there now as part of the private possessions by Christians. Um, we don't know any numbers at all about this, um, and I, that, I think there was also the question if they should be retrieved or not, for example, manuscripts from Ethiopia, if they should be brought to Israel, I, I think this would be very uh, difficult undertaking. Um, and the question from Ilana, um, the, the main collections that we know now are in Israel itself, the Tel Aviv collection uh, from Feitlovich and the um, National Library, and in uh, France, the Bibliothèque Nationale with the collection of uh, 
Davadi and Griol. I think those two uh, collected the, the largest number of manuscripts. A follow-up question on manuscripts. This one from David Hamidovich. Um, uh, he asks, from manuscript and material perspectives, can you speak about Beta Israel scribalism, that is special or specific paleographical or codicological characteristics? Hmm. Um, so besides those that I presented here, so I, th I think, for example, the erasing of the cross ornaments and of course erasing of words, adding doxology, these are the very striking and strong uh, features. Uh, besides that, there is something that uh, Ted Erho discussed uh, with me about the layout of manuscripts. So even though the, the Better Israel manuscript, the so small sized ones are rather small and they are very often found in one column layout. And this is very um, unique compared to the same age Christian manuscripts. So this would be something that we could look into which I have not yet uh, had the time to do so. Um, but let's say scribal features. Um, so the, the number 20, if you write it as a numeral, uh, reads Isra. And if you then add the El, it means Israel. And I, found, I find this very often in the manuscripts. It is also employed by Christian scribes, but I find this a lot. Besides that, the two traditions are very close to each other and I wouldn't know any striking specific letters or, or so of any kind. My turn. Um, so there was a sort of two related questions about Buddha, um, Marsha. Um, Zeben Elema mentions that uh, Buddha or Hyena is not used only for Beta Israel, but is used all over Right. Um, the country and um, Tseganesh Mehari says, in fact, all of Gojam also. Um, so just a question about have you been able to sort of find other um, attestations of this? Yes, and, and, and in fact, the Jesuits in the 17th century were worried about being called Buddha. And there was one um, Jesuit whose last name was Lobo, and they asked him to use a, a different name because Wolf um, would have uh, uh, caused him problems. Uh, this was in a it's in in the book by um, uh, Alos Montaner, and uh, so I th I think that that um, this I idea of uh, of Buddha is is um, is not restricted at all to um, to Beta Israel, uh, and and it, it can um, fasten on to um, other non Amhara or, or uh, marginalized uh, groups. But it's it's interesting that it seems, uh, at least in the later sources. Um, uh, that this uh, idea seems to have crystallized and, and, and it, it seems to have been a prominent um, uh, charge. Uh, uh, so should we go to a next question? Um, uh, this one from Richard Croft. How does Ethiopian Christian antisemitism relate to other forms of Christian antisemitism? I understood Ethiopian Christianity was more Jewish in its founding. That is, they see themselves as relating to Solomon. Does the antisemitism just have social political motivations? Does it relate to external interactions with other Christians? Could it be racially motivated? And I guess this could be for any one of the panelists. Um, I could just say a few words I don't have. Uh others should jump in, but I would frame it more as anti-Judaism in this context than anti-Semitism, probably. But um, the one point that always comes up is you have this juxtaposition between the anti-Judaism of Ethiopian Christianity and its um, alleged Judaic roots. And 
we've questioned a little bit the Judaic roots, even though some things probably will stand, like say the um, Sabbath on Saturday, which I think we also have a question about. But um, these aren't mutually exclusive. So there's kind of a, a famous example in Syriac Christianity with um, Ephraim the Syrian, the fourth century author, who has vitriolic anti-Judaism, yet at the same time is deeply indebted to Jewish hermeneutical traditions, for instance. So uh, th these are not mutually exclusive to be um, anti-Jewish and have connections with Judaism, whether known or unknown. So the framing of it in that way, I'm not entirely sure is helpful kind of historically. This happens kind of quite regularly. So that's what I was trying to get at by this idea of a conceptual split um, that uh, there are, you know, good Hebrews or the Old Testament Hebrews and then the, the bad Jews from uh, the gospel story, the antagonists of, of Jesus, uh, and then later uh, Jews who uh, have not converted that sort of thing. And that's really common across the whole Christian uh, sphere in the from late antiquity and um, the Middle Ages. But I, I will say um, that the more that I've looked at Ethiopian art, I, I, I really have to say that it's, that these sites of anti-Judaism are quite restricted and really do not, overwhelm uh, the art. And, um, and I, I think that it would be at, at some point, what I would like to do is um, have a comparative study or to uh, enter into a comparative study of Byzantine and Ethiopian and Latin Christian representations uh, um, of Jews and and and, um, and it seems to me that the more I think about it, the more exceptional Latin uh, the Latin tradition is for its virulently um, uh, anti-Jewish um, uh, ap approaches and tendencies, and I think that this is really an aesthetic and structural artistic issue. And not just, uh, I mean, I think there's something in that, this artistic tradition, which uh, encourages the proliferation of anti-Judaism in a way that you don't find in Byzantine or Ethiopian art, despite the fact that there is a lot of anti-Judaism in the patristics and in the, in the textual sources, it doesn't migrate into the visual realm. And I, I, I think it's an aesthetic issue um, as, uh, you know, as, uh, as well as just having a trigger from outside sociological, uh, uh, it, so it's just not the way the ca artistic canons unfold in, Byzantine and in um, Ethiopian art. So it's really very isolated. Well, unfortunately, our time is up. Um, we have so many more questions that I'm afraid we didn't have time to get to. But thanks again to all of our panelists for being here. And thanks to all of our attendees. We hope you enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. And again, please um, go back to our webpage at the Institute for Advanced Studies. Any materials that we are able to put up afterwards, slides, for instance, or um, follow-up points, we will be doing that on um, the webpage. And you'll also have information there about future webinars. So thanks to everyone. Thanks to our speakers.